God, we just thank you for your word uh, that brings light and brings life. I pray that we would be uh, humble listeners, Lord. I uh, pray that we would be quick to, uh, to heed your words, quick to obey, Lord. And I pray that we would do that because we love you, because we want to see you glorified and honored in our lives. So I pray that you would uh, grow us in holiness tonight through your word. I pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, thanks for being here. My name is Kyle Frazee. I'm a seminary student. Uh, Smed is out of town this weekend, uh, so we're taking a quick break from Daniel. But I thought that since Sunday night seemed like we could only do the Old Testament, that we would stay uh, in the Old Testament tonight and look at a passage that actually runs concurrent to the book of Daniel, at least the first couple chapters. So we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 38 tonight. Jeremiah chapter 38, looking at verses 14 through 28. This passage is uh, the last warning to the king of Israel before the the final destruction of Jerusalem. And we're going to see in this passage uh, what faith looks like and uh, what it doesn't look like. We're going to see belief and unbelief. You see, uh, faith and obedience are, are two sides of the same coin. If you believe God, you believe his word, then you'll obey him. You'll do what he says. And on the other side, when you disobey, it's because you don't believe. There's something about God you don't trust, that you don't believe, that you don't have faith in. A friend of mine uses this analogy when having evangelistic conversations. Uh, He says it's like talking to someone and telling them that there's actually a missile that's pointed at you, it's going to land tomorrow at noon in your living room, and for the person to say, thank you, I believe what you're saying to me, And then you find them at noon the next day, sitting on their couch, watching TV, you know, watching the football game. In that moment, you would say, do you you actually believe my words? If you believed what I said, you would do something about it, right? You would leave. You'd leave the couch. So you must not believe. I was thinking about a a conversation I had with my, uh, one of my children this week, just talking about some small difficulties in life, uh, a younger sibling that's destroying a bedroom, Uh, being unkind, you know, working through what does it look like to to not be angry, to to not complain. And in this conversation, we were just talking through uh, when we complain against the Lord, uh, when we disobey, when we're angry, there's something going on in our hearts uh, that, that doesn't believe God's word, that actually doubts God's character. We're actually questioning what God has said because if God is all wise and all knowing, if he controls the, the planets and the stars, and he works all things for our good and his glory, then what could we grumble about, right? When we're grumbling, we're saying, God, you're actually not doing a good job. We're actually saying, you know, you can have the stars and the planets, but when it comes to my life, I think I would be more wise. I think I would do a better job orchestrating things. You know, if God does know the future, actually has control over the future, if he has like he says he does, orchestrated all events to this day under his sovereign control, then how could we question any events in our lives? You see, any any questioning of of circumstances is is a sign of unbelief. And we're going to see that tonight in our passage. We're going to see unbelief, uh, a picture of unbelief. And I think this passage can help us to to root it out, to actually root out unbelief in our lives, Uh, to compel us to trust the Lord in hard circumstances uh, when obedience is costly. I think it'll actually help us to to grow in our faith. So we're going to look at Jeremiah 38 together, uh, the second half of Jeremiah 38, starting in verse 14. Then King Zedekiah sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance that is in the house of the Lord, And the king said to Jeremiah, I'm going to ask you something. Do not hide anything from me. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I tell you, will you not certainly put me to death? Besides, if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. But King Zedekiah swore to Jeremiah in secret, saying, As the Lord lives, who made this life for us, surely I will not put you to death, nor will I give you over to the hand of these men who are seeking your life. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you will indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live. 
This city will not be burned with fire, and you and your household will survive. But if you will not go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then this city will be given over to the hand of the Chaldeans. They will burn it with fire, and you yourself will not escape from their hand. Then King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I dread the Jews who have gone over to the Chaldeans, for they may give me over into the hand into their hand, and they will abuse me. But Jeremiah said, They will not give you over. Please obey the Lord in what I am saying to you, that it may go well with you, and that you may live. But if you keep refusing to go out, this is the word which the Lord has shown me. Behold, all the women who have been left in the palace of the king of Judah are going to be brought out to the officers of the king of Babylon. And those women will say, Your close friends have misled and overpowered you. While your feet sunk in the mire, they turned back. They will also bring out all your wives and your sons to the Chaldeans, and you yourself will not escape from their hand, but will be seized by the hand of the king of Babylon, and this city will be burned with fire. Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, Let no man know about these words, and you will not die. But if the officials hear that I have talked with you and come to you and say to you, Tell us now what you said to the king and what the king has said to you, do not hide it from us, and we will not put you to death. And you are to say to them, I was presenting my petition before the king not to make me return to the house of Jonathan to die there. Then all the officials came to Jeremiah and questioned him. So he reported to them in accordance with all these words which the king had commanded. And they ceased speaking with him since the conversation had not been overheard. So Jeremiah stayed in the court of the guardhouse until the day that Jerusalem was captured. So we see in this passage the unbelief of one man on display, King Zedekiah. But really, this is the unbelief of the nation of Judah. He stands as the last king of Judah, representing this apostate nation, uh, really as a, as a picture of their unbelief. And now they have, because of their unbelief, they're going to have to leave the land. In the, the early pages of Scripture, when the, the Jews come to the promised land, God says to them in, in Deuteronomy, he says, if you, if you obey my voice, if you listen to my words, then you will dwell securely in the land. But if you do not listen, you do not obey, then you will be spit out of the land. And that's what's happening here is the, the Jews have not listened, they have not obeyed, and now their final king is a picture of that unbelief. He's really a figurehead here at the end of this nation to, to see unbelief. So we're going to look at three manifestations tonight of unbelief, of this destructive unbelief. Uh, and this is unbelief at the clear word of God. And just a quick background on Zedekiah, quick history lesson. Uh, you've probably heard his name in some of the, the study on Daniel. Uh, if you remember that Jehoiakim was the king of Judah when Nebuchadnezzar came to Babylon during the, the first uh, deportation. That's when Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were deported. Uh, this is uh, 11 years before this passage. So you have two deportations. The first one is uh, Daniel's deportation, uh, King Je Jehoiakim. Well, at that point, Nebuchadnezzar sets up a king in Judah uh, named Jehoiachin, who only lasts for three months, after that, Nebuchadnezzar sets up Zedekiah as king. So Zedekiah is from the, the line of David. He's a Davidic king, but he's been installed by Nebuchadnezzar. So he's still king in Jerusalem. They still have their city walls. They still have the temple. They still have prophets. But their, half of their people have been taken. A lot of their nobles have been taken. Their former king is in Babylon. So it's a, it's a hard life. It's a hard, hard way to be king. Zedekiah has to pay tribute, the best of his crops, uh, even the best of their people are sent to Babylon. But they still have their city, they still have the temple. So Zedekiah steps into this role, and right off the bat, he, he looks for a way out. Rather than submitting to what God's providence was for him, God's command was to actually submit to Nebuchadnezzar. If you would just turn two chapters over to Ezekiel, just to help put this in context... Ezekiel chapter 17. After Zedekiah becomes king, this is what happens. Ezekiel 17, if you look at verse 11, this is Ezekiel speaking. He says, Moreover, 
the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Do you not know what these things mean? Say, Behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem, took its kings and its princes, and brought them to him in Babylon. That was Jehoiakim, that was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 13, He took one of the royal family and made a covenant with him, putting him under oath. He also took away the mighty of the land, And this covenant was made with Zedekiah. And it says in verse 14 that the kingdom might be in subjection, not exalting itself, but keeping his covenant that it might continue. But he, that is Zedekiah, rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar by sending envoys to Egypt that they might give him horses and many troops. Will he succeed? Will he who does such a thing escape? Can he indeed break the covenant and escape? As I live, declares the Lord God. Surely in the country of the king who put him on the throne, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke, in Babylon he, that is Zedekiah, shall die. So you see this uh, right after Zedekiah becomes king. He tries to, to get out of this situation, this hard situation. Submission to Nebuchadnezzar. He looks for a, an alt- alternative. Well, maybe if I make a treaty with Egypt, we could have our city back. Egypt's a better partner than Nebuchadnezzar. So you see this this rebellion on display by this king right off the bat. And now God says that there's going to be certain judgment for him. You can turn back to Jeremiah. But even in Ezekiel, God says that even if Job and Daniel and Noah lived in Jerusalem, he would not spare the city. At this point, it's too far gone. Even if the most righteous men of all time He's saying, if the most righteous men that have ever walked the earth lived in this city, he said, I still would not spare this city. He has decreed judgment against Jerusalem. So that's where we find ourselves in Jeremiah 38, in this situation where judgment is coming. There's actually now a second siege. Babylon has come back to attack this city. Egypt has fled. So now Zedekiah has no other options. He can't go to Egypt. He can't keep rebelling. He has to actually submit to what God says. So in this moment of trial, in this desperation, we see Zedekiah call out to Jeremiah for a, for a word from the Lord. And we see his unbelief when he hears that word. And again, this is the, the last prophecy. This is the last warning that Zedekiah receives. There's one last chance to obey. God is saying the judgment is fixed, but Zedekiah could still be faithful. He could still walk in obedience He could still obey God's clear, hard instruction. So we're going to see through this passage, we're going to see three manifestations of unbelief at God's clear word. Three manifestations of unbelief at God's clear word. First, in verses 14 through 16, we're going to see Zedekiah presume on the Lord's kindness. Presuming on the Lord's kindness. Zedekiah fetches Jeremiah Right? He's in this hard situation. The city is being attacked. Now he wants to hear a word from the Lord. In verse 14, it says that he brought Jeremiah into the, the third entrance to the house of the Lord in the temple. This seems to be a secret meeting. He wants to hide this from the other officials in the city that don't want them to surrender. They want to keep fighting against Babylon. And Jeremiah, verse 15, is obviously skeptical. He says, if I tell you, this word from the Lord, will you not certainly put me to death? So you start to see right off the bat, Jeremiah knows this presumption. He's not trusting the words of of Zedekiah. There's a history here. If you back up just a few verses in this chapter, you actually see that Jeremiah was just rescued from a, a well. He was thrown into a pit to die because they were angry at his words, because he told the people to surrender. So now when Zedekiah comes to him again, he's obviously gonna think, okay, I just told you this clear instruction. You tried to kill me. What's going to be different this time? And Zedekiah says now to convince Jeremiah, verse 16, he says, as the Lord lives, as Yahweh lives, who made this life for us, surely I will not put you to death. He's trying to convince him. I'm genuine this time. This time I'm really genuine. And if you had just stepped into this book, like many of you tonight, maybe you haven't read it for a year, two years, you know, it's part of your Bible reading plan, and you might think, well, it seems like Zedekiah is 
is trusting here. You know, he's doing the right thing. He's looking for God's word. That seems like a good response, right? Well, you have to back up a little bit in Jeremiah to see if that's accurate. Is this, is, is Zedekiah really humble? Is he wanting to hear God's word? We've already seen him scheme to try to get Egypt to bail him out. But let's look back and just see a couple other instances where he had God's clear instruction of what he must do. If you turn back to Jeremiah 21, starting in verse 1, Jeremiah 21, verse 1, it says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, when King Zedekiah sent to him, Pashur the son of Malchijah and Zephaniah the priest, the, the son of Messai, saying, Please inquire of the Lord on our behalf, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is warring against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful acts, so that the enemy will withdraw from us. So you see Zedekiah, this is a presumption on God's kindness. He has done this before. He's asking for a word from the Lord, saying, God will be kind to us. Well, here's what Jeremiah says in verse 3. Jeremiah said to them, You shall say to Zedekiah as follows, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am about to turn back the weapons of war which are in your hands, with which you are warring against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who are besieging you outside the wall. And I will gather them in the center of this city, and I myself will war against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm, even in anger and wrath and indignation. And I will strike down the inhabitants of this city. Verse 7, he says, I will give over Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people, even those who survive in this city, from the pestilence, the sword, and the famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So you see, this, isn't the, this is not the first time that Zedekiah has reached out to Jeremiah in panic, saying, I want a word from the Lord. Tell me what I must do. Turn over a couple more pages. Jeremiah 27, verse 11. Jeremiah 27, 11. Jeremiah writes, But the nation which will bring its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let re remain on its land, declares the Lord, and they will till it and dwell in it. I spoke all these words like all these to Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and live. Why will you die and your people by the sword, famine, and pestilence as the Lord has spoken to the nation? which will not serve the king of Babylon. And just turn one more, one more spot. You see again there, this clear instruction. This is what you must do. Submit to Nebuchadnezzar. Surrender yourself to him. Jeremiah 34, starting in verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, with all the kingdoms of the earth that were under his dominion, and all the peoples were fighting against Jerusalem and against all its cities, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it with fire. You will not escape from his hand, for you will surely be captured and delivered. And you will see the king of Babylon eye to eye, and he will speak with you face to face, and you will go to Babylon. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah, Thus says the Lord concerning you, you will not die by the sword. You will die in peace. So just uh, hammering this point home a bit, that, that Zedekiah obviously had heard God's word. The instruction was clear. This was not the first time. This was not the second time. This was not the third time. So you see the, the presumption here. He's assuming the Lord has been kind all these times when I have not listened. So let me ask him again. Let me demand from the Lord another word. You see the, the presumption, the lack of faith over and over again. Now we get back to now Jeremiah 37, right before our passage, just looking at verse 16 and 17. Jeremiah 37, 16 and 17. For Jeremiah had come into the dungeon that is the vaulted cell, and Jeremiah stayed there many days. Verse 17, now King Zedekiah sent and took him out, and in his palace the king secretly asked him and said, is there a word from the Lord? Jeremiah said, there is. And he said, you will be given into the hand of the king of Babylon. So at this point, it's almost comical that 
that Zedekiah would keep asking for a word from the Lord as if he's going to get something different. He's told him, this is what's going to happen. This is what's been decreed. You must submit to the king. And Zedekiah refuses, refuses, keeps presuming on the Lord's kindness, but yet still wants to hear from the Lord. He was not willing to kill the prophet. There seems to be some kind of conviction over sin, some kind of a burdened conscience. But yet he doesn't listen. He doesn't obey. And even look at the way that that he asks in verse 16, when Zedekiah says, as Yahweh lives, he's actually making a, a promise here. He's saying, he's basically saying, if I lie to you as Yahweh lives, let it be done to me. So this is actually a statement of faith, saying because God lives, because I trust that God lives, we know that we can trust each other. And the obvious response would be, well, if Yahweh lives, if you believe that, why have you not obeyed? Why have you rebelled all of these times if you believe that Yahweh lives? To to swear by the name of the Lord is to say, I believe him. I believe in his character. I believe in his promises. For, For Zedekiah to say this, what he's saying is, I believe that God has made a promise to Abraham that his people will live in the land securely. I believe that God has made a promise to David that he'll have a king on the throne forever. You see, if Zedekiah had believed those promises, he would have obeyed. Right, he, the problem is he didn't, actually, he didn't actually believe. He did not believe those promises. So he's taking up the, name, the Lord's name in vain. Think about the third commandment, right? Do not take up God's name in vain. Do not be a hypocrite. Do not walk with God's name without obeying. And that's what's going on here. If you believe God, if you believe that he upholds the universe by his words, if you believe that he made promises to people and that he actually carries out those promises, then you would obey him. You would do what he says, So what's really going on here is Zedekiah is looking for a way out. He's looking for another word, a different word. He has a clear instruction, doesn't want to obey it. He's uh, presuming on the Lord's kindness. He's looking at God as this uh, genie in a bottle that I'm going to rub when things get hard. I'm going to look for help when my life is in distress or the, the magic eight ball that I can shake and look for answers. But this isn't faith. Right? Who doesn't want to know the future? Right, I can make that decision. If I knew the future, then I would do that. Well, now he actually sees the future, and he still doesn't do it. It's because he doesn't believe. I'm sure you've heard the saying, uh, there are no atheists in foxholes. And that's, that's what's going on here. In a hard situation, uh, he cries out to the Lord. But that's not an indication of faith. To cry out to God when things are hard is not an indication of faith. What you do with God's word on ordinary days when things aren't hard That is an indication of your faith. What you do Monday through Friday at work, when nobody's looking, when no one knows if you're working hard or not, what you do when you're alone by yourself and you're tested, that's an indication of faith. You know, trials just press us. They show what's already there. They show our character. But but an indication of faith is what do we do in, in routine, ordinary life with God's word? Do you believe it? Do you submit to it? For Zedekiah here to to cry out to the Lord when he has no other options doesn't demonstrate faith, right? That just demonstrates that he's at the end of himself and he's looking to God for for blessing, for his his own solution on his terms. That's presumption, right? If God's word is not compelling to obey when times are good, what would make it compelling when times are hard? Why, if, if your life is falling apart, would you assume oh, I could, I, could, I could really submit then, but I won't submit when things are easy. That's just wanting uh, blessings from God. That's wanting God to be your, your genie in a bottle, not to actually submit to him. So you see the, the presumption that he is here for Zedekiah. He's assuming that he can always have a second chance. He's had a, a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth chance, and he comes back again looking for another chance. That's presumption. That's assuming that God will, will never judge. I can just disbelieve over and over again without any consequence. This is what John Anderson was was talking about last week in Mark chapter 4 with the the parable of the sower and the seed that that there's a presumption that that unbelief won't be your last time, that you could actually reject God's word and think, I still have one more chance. This could be the last chance that you hear God's word. If you harden your heart, it may be the last chance. And this is the case for Zedekiah who's had time and time and time, and he actually, this is the last time. 
This is the very last chance he gets to obey God's word. And at the same time, we actually see God's grace here. He actually does get a final chance. Even after all of his unbelief, God says, here's what you must do and you will live. You can actually still walk in obedience. You can still be faithful after all of this. Obey and live. And that's going to lead us to our, our second point. The, the opportunity now that he has, we're going to see what he does with God's clear instruction. Uh, the second manifestation of unbelief at God's clear word, God's clear instruction to him, we see putting conditions on obedience. Putting conditions on obedience. When Zedekiah gets the, the clear instruction, he puts conditions on it. I'll obey if it's like this, or I won't obey if it's this hard. We see the, the unbelieving response of saying, I'll obey up to a certain point, as long as it fits within what I'm comfortable with. Verse 17, Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live. This city will not be burned with fire, and your household will survive. Jeremiah is, is calling on him to remember God's character. He's saying the, the God of hosts, the one who controls the armies of heaven, has also made himself to be the God of Israel. This small nation that's under siege, God is still their God. He is still looking out for them. He has actually planned this captivity to purify his people. God is still in control is what he's saying. Believe God is what Jeremiah is pleading with. Pleading with Zedekiah to do. He's saying believe. Believe God's character. And yet he, he obviously doesn't. He puts conditions on God. He puts conditions on what he will do to obey. Verse 18 says, but if you will not go out, to the officers, the king of Babylon, this city will be given over to the hand of the Chaldeans and they will burn it with fire and you yourself will not escape from their hand. So he has two options here, right? You can obey and be saved. Your family can be saved or you can disobey and your family will die. The city will be burned. You see, he's in a, he's in a, in a really hard circumstance. This is a hard, this is hard obedience to surrender his people, to surrender his nation, his land, to give up. That's not an easy ask, but that would be obedience. That would be faithfulness. If he said, I want to please the Lord at all costs, I'll do whatever it takes because I love the Lord, I trust him, so I'm going to walk in obedience. That's what it would look like to step forward, regardless of the cost, regardless of what will happen to, to, to Zedekiah if he surrenders. That's what God has called him to do, is to obey regardless of cost. And yet he has conditions on what he will do. And we see that in verse 19. He says, I dread the Jews who have gone over, that they should abuse me. Really what he's saying is the cost is too high. You're asking too much of me. I'm afraid. There, there are people already in Babylon, the, the Jews that were already taken into Babylon, are watching Zedekiah now rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. Now imagine for them to be already enslaved in Babylon. Now their king back home is rebelling against their new king. How do you think that's going to make their new king feel about them as a people? You know, now Babylon is soured against God's people that are already enslaved. They're going to be mistreated. They're going to be treated worse because of Zedekiah's decisions. So of course they're going to be unhappy with Zedekiah. They're watching him make terrible decision after terrible decision. It's impacting their lives. So Zedekiah is saying, I'm afraid of those people. I'm afraid of the ones that I would have to deal with if I surrender. It's like if you ever heard someone, a, a fan, a football fan, complain about a coach after the game, like, oh, that was such a bad decision. That was such a bad decision. Well, these are like the ultimate armchair quarterbacks here. These people that are, that are watching their former king make bad decision after bad decision, impact their lives. Of course they don't like him. Of course they're going to be upset at him. And now what Zedekiah is being asked to do is surrender and join them in Babylon. That's a hard, that's a hard ask. That'd be hard obedience. And he says he's afraid. Right? And that's where faith would come in to say, regardless of the, the circumstance, regardless of the ask, 
regardless of the cost, I'm going to step forward because I believe God. But he doesn't want to deal with hard things. He doesn't want to deal with consequences. He doesn't trust God. There's a limit to obedience here. And these are just common excuses, common excuses that we'd all have, right? It's too hard. I fear men, right? There are, there are too many consequences for that. I fear what other people will think. It's costly. It's not easy. So he doesn't obey. He doesn't want to deal with consequences, right? He sits in the middle, Zedekiah, of having rebelled, having made terrible decisions, he actually rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Now he has to, what God's asking him to do is to face Nebuchadnezzar, to say, actually, surrender yourself to Nebuchadnezzar. And Smed's pointed out several times just the brutality of Nebuchadnezzar as a king, especially when he conquered nations. So of course Zedekiah is going to be afraid of him. But again, this is what God requires of him, to, to submit, to deal with the consequences of his actions. He has rebelled and rebelled, and now he must face the music. And he's saying, you must do that to be faithful. And we see that just in our, in our culture, I think in our own hearts, just the not wanting to deal with consequences. You know, assuming that we shouldn't have to pay the price of bad decisions. Um, just in a, in a country that people don't want to pay their, their loans, right? I made decisions, I got loans, I don't want to pay those back. Uh, I don't want people that have done crimes to actually get punished in the way that they should. There's just an aversion to people having to, to pay consequences, to deal with their actions. That's a human problem, as Zedekiah displays here. But he's saying, you, you must walk in obedience and deal with the consequences of your actions. You're just thinking about how this might look for us of just, you know, in a marriage relationship, when there's conflict, a spouse sins against another spouse, having to, to walk in obedience, ask for forgiveness, you know, maybe someone has made a mess of a relationship. Now, what would obedience look like? It would look like asking for forgiveness, moving forward, admitting to sins, maybe even confessing things that have been done in the past. And that's not an easy path. That may actually make relationships harder. That may actually cause strain in, in a marriage. But that's what God would want. That's what repentance would look like. Or was thinking about a, a parent a parent who hasn't disciplined their child for 10 years, imagine a 10-year-old that's just only been given what they want for their whole life. It's just a, a monster. It's, a, it's able to watch TV all day, never been told no, and now, now the parents are convicted by God's word saying, oh, we must walk in obedience, we must discipline and instruct and admonish. Well, that's going to be a really hard path for them. You know, the next day is not going to be easier when they have to, instead of letting their kid watch TV for six hours a day, they have to sit at the dinner table for two hours. They have to help someone learn how to clean a room maybe three times that day. Like, that's not an easy path of obedience, but that's what, the, that's what obedience would look like. That's what faithfulness would look like. To say, you know what, I've actually made a lot of bad decisions that have led me here, but today I'm going to be faithful, regardless of the cost, regardless of the consequence, regardless of how hard and to move forward. And that's what's being asked of Zedekiah here. But instead, he, he rails against God's providence. He doesn't want to have a harder life. He doesn't want to have to give up his control of his circumstances. One commentator, uh, theologian, says this of obedience. It says, obedience is bending of the will to God's will. Bending of the will to God's will. This is when it, when it doesn't feel good, when you don't feel at peace with the circumstance. There are no good feelings here for Zedekiah. Right? Even in obedience, he would give up his land, give up his people, but that would be faithfulness. In verse 18, what will happen if he disobeys is his city will be burned, his family given up, there's no easy way out here. Instead, he's tried already to come up with another option, to rebel, to go to Egypt. You just see the, the irrational nature of unbelief. To have God's clear instruction, here's what you must do, and try to find any other option for how he can get out of this. 
What's another way that I don't have to do this? I'll do anything besides what you have asked, Lord. I'll make an alliance with Egypt. I'll just lock the gate and hide in here while Babylon sieges the city. He knows what he must do, and he's just irrational. This is what sin does to us. Makes us irrational, makes us make foolish decisions. Think about Paul in 1 Timothy when he says before he was saved, he acted ignorantly in unbelief. I think we could look at that and say, oh, ignorant unbelief. That would be like he just didn't know better. Well, ignorant unbelief is, is this. It's what Zedekiah is doing. To know God's clear word and to just be irrational. To disregard it at his own cost. And there's no happy ending here promised for Zedekiah. He's going to be a, in service to, a, to an evil, hard king the rest of his life. But he would be faithful. He would still have God's promises. He would be able to live. I think even in this, Jeremiah is saying, you will, you will live. There's actually life for you in this. To follow God's word. Spiritual life. Think about the opposite of Zedekiah in Jeremiah. Jeremiah has suffered greatly for this message. He was just thrown into a pit to die before this. He was thrown in prison. Comes before Zedekiah already been suffered, already suffered, already been mistreated, and he opens his mouth and says the same exact thing, the same hard word again, the same costly word that had already been sent him to prison. He says it again. He says it faithfully. He says it boldly. And that's what King Zedekiah is being asked to do, is to stand alone, to stand boldly, knowing that, that no nobles will support him. The leaders of the city will be against him. The Jews who have already surrendered will be against him. Nebuchadnezzar will be against him. But he'll stand with the Lord. That's what's being asked. Stand alone with God and be faithful. And he refuses. His unbelief is, is evident in his, his refusal, his questioning. And ultimately, again, his problem is that he just doesn't believe God's word. It's not compelling enough for him. And again, that is the, the sign of our faith is what do we do with God's word? Do we obey it? And that's going to bring us to the third manifestation of unbelief at God's clear word in this passage. Third manifestation of unbelief at God's clear word is ignoring a burdened conscience. Ignoring a burdened conscience. Verse 20. Jeremiah said, They will not give you over. Please obey the Lord. And what I am saying to you, that it may go well with you and you may live. Again, there's this offer of life to, to Zedekiah. You can still obey. You can still live. And, verse 21 and 22, we see consequences. But if you refuse, verse 22, behold, all the women who have been left in the palace of the king are going to be brought out to the officers of the king of Babylon. And these women will say, your close friends have misled and overpowered you. While your feet were sunk in the mire, they turned back. And this bringing out of the, of the women here in his palace, this is like when Absalom overthrew uh, Jerusalem, kicked David out of Jerusalem and took his concubines on the roof, defiled them publicly. That's the, the idea here, but it's going out of the women. He's actually saying, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to not just take your city the Nebuchadnezzar is not just going to take your city. He's going to just bring public shame to you. goes on in verse 23 to say that his wives will be brought out and his sons will be brought out to the Chaldeans. And this bringing out is actually like a death march. So he's saying they're going to be killed. Your wives and sons will be killed. The women will be brought out and they will say of you that your close friends have deceived you. They will leave you sunk in the mud He'll be totally alone. So Zedekiah here, who fears man, doesn't want to do hard things, is afraid of people, doesn't want to be, do what God says and be left alone, will rebel against God and end up alone. He trusts in man, and then he's left with nothing. And you have in this uh, a little bit of a play on words. In verse 17, um, Jeremiah says to Zedekiah that you should go out. And the same root word is being used in verse 23 when it says they will be let out. So he's basically saying you, should, you will go out on your own accord or I will bring you out. 
It's kind of like there are, there are two options here. You can do this the, the easy way or the hard way. Either way, it ends up with you in the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar. God's saying, you can do it my way or your way, but it's going to end up in the same place. It's like if you've ever told your child, you know, you must eat those five bites of food on your plate. And you lay down that gauntlet with your kids, and then you have to, to follow through. And you have this conversation, or at least I have, where it's like, we could sit here for, for two hours, and you could not play outside, you could not have any fun, and you're going to eat that food, or you could eat the food, and we can go play outside and have fun. But either way, this ends with you eating the food. That's what's going on here. God's saying, this is not going to end your way. This is going to end my way. You have two options, to obey and, and end up in captivity or disobey and end up in captivity. And we see God, the God of second chances here, God of third chances, fourth, fifth chances for Zedekiah, says this is your final chance. There's actually a day when the music stops when God will actually pour out his judgment, unleash his wrath. And he's saying that day has come for this city, and that day has come for Zedekiah. And Zedekiah's first response was fear, right? In the, in the earlier chapter, in the earlier verses, in verse 19, he said, I dread the Jews. Well, now, what's his response? Verse 24, he says to Jeremiah, let no man know about these words. He says, don't tell anyone so that you won't get killed. Right? And it seems honorable. It seems like he's saying, I care about you, Jeremiah. I don't want you to get killed. So you might think, okay, maybe he's weighing some things here. And it seems like there's a, a burdened conscience. There's some conviction. He doesn't kill Jeremiah right off the bat. He's listening. He knows this is God's word. But what does he do with it? He doesn't do anything. He actually doesn't change at all. He just tells Jeremiah not to tell anyone. If he actually believed this, he would say, I'm going to tell everyone we got to surrender. Regardless of the consequences, we have to obey what God says. And instead, he's just quiet. He's respectful of the messenger. He listens. He says, thank you for telling me that. And then he sits on his couch, unmoved. Destruction coming. Says, yes, I believe you, and doesn't do anything. That's the, the conviction, the, the conscience being burdened to feel conviction, to say, yeah, I know that God is saying something. I know this is God's word, but to do nothing about it. That's a, that's a sign of unbelief. That's what Zedekiah manifests here. It's like the one that, that hears God's word, sits here on a Sunday. Oh man, that's convicting. My life must change. And then goes home and does nothing. Makes no change, feels conviction, but doesn't actually change. Shows unbelief. That shows a heart that actually doesn't believe what God says. And we see in this story, we see in the, in the life of Zedekiah, in this final scene of his, of his rule as king, this unbelief. God's clear word given to him, and he's unmoved. He's not compelled by it. Our faith would look like hearing God's word and obeying at all costs because you trust him, because you believe that he knows best. And instead, he puts his head in the sand thinks that God won't judge. He hasn't judged me yet. He'll be faithful again. He'll be gracious to me. He doesn't do anything. And we'll see the end of the story here in, in chapter 30, 39. He's unmoved. You see, he seeks God's word in the moment of distress, in a moment of weakness. Hears it, is respectful even of God's word, but he doesn't submit to it because ultimately he doesn't believe it. Look ahead at chapter 39. We're going to see the, the outcome here, the result of this unbelief, a tragic outcome, not just for Zedekiah, but for his people, for his family. Jeremiah 39, verse 1. Now when Jerusalem was captured in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city wall was breached. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came in and sat down at the middle gate. And down in verse 4, when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them, they fled and went out of the city at night by the way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls and went out toward the Arabah. So you see this final manifestation of unbelief. When the, when the going gets really tough, Zedekiah flees. 
final unbelief in his, in his heart is shown in his fleeing. Verse 5, the army of the Chaldeans pursued them, overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. They seized him and brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on him. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes at Riblah. The king of Babylon also slew all the nobles of Judah. He then blinded Zedekiah's eyes and bound him in fetters of bronze to bring him to Babylon. The Chaldeans also burned with fire the king's palace and the houses of the people, and they broke down the walls of Jerusalem. You see this tragic end to, to Zedekiah, to his family. The last thing that he sees on this earth is his children being slaughtered before his eyes, before he loses his sight. He could have saved his family if he would listen to God's word. God said his family would have been saved, his children would have been spared, and instead he chose death and destruction. And this is the end of unbelief. This is where it leads. It leads to destruction, leads to death, despair. The one who is unwilling to follow God's clear words today, the one who is unwilling to do hard things in this life that God says we must do, the one who is not compelled by what God says, this leads to destruction. We get this picture here of, of an eternal reality, rejecting God's word, an ultimate destruction. We see Zedekiah here as a memorial of unbelief for the people of Israel. And obviously, this story sits here for a reason, not just to sadden us, but actually to encourage us, to encourage us to believe God's promises. This is not a unique issue to Zedekiah. In this book of God's judgment of unbelief of the people, God is giving this picture of here's what unbelief looks like so that you would believe. This is to encourage the exiled people now receiving these words to actually to believe God's words, to look to his solutions. For the people who have trusted in men, he's saying, don't trust in men. Don't trust in kings. And this leaves the, the people, obviously, to beg for a, a better king, a different king. If you turn back to Jeremiah 23, and we'll close here. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is his name by which he will be called, Yahweh our righteousness. See this promise of, a, of another king, of a future king, one who will be the righteousness of his people, See, this book here, this, this section of Jeremiah, points to this last king of Judah, the unbelief of this last king, and, and points the people to look for the greater king, the other king. You know, Zedekiah's name means, Yahweh is my righteousness. That's what Zedekiah means. And you see in this passage in, in Jeremiah 23, the people looking for one whose name will be called, Yahweh is our righteousness. To, to look for a different king. That's what faith is, to trust God's promise. For the people here to trust God's promise of a coming Messiah, of a coming kingdom. I mean, we find ourselves still waiting for this future king to reign. Jesus, who reigns in heaven, has not yet taken the throne in Jerusalem, like was promised in this verse in Jeremiah 23. So we're not in the middle of captivity, needing to press on, to trust God that will be delivered, but we're in different circumstances where we need to trust God, trust his sure word, trust his promises, trust in his solutions. And that's what faith is. It's taking God at his word, believing his promises, believing in his solutions. It's believing that God's ways are better than our ways. It's yielding to him, the one who holds the stars together, the one who has promised a deliverance for his people, that's what our faith should look like, trusting what God has said, trusting in a, in a future promise, in a future reward. Would you pray with me? God, we just thank you so much for your words.
We thank you for uh, exhortations that we receive through others. We know that these things are written uh, for our benefit, Lord, so that we would believe, so that we would walk in faithful obedience. We would be compelled again today to trust you, Lord. You are trustworthy. You are good. You do good. All that you do is good. So I pray that we would continue to walk in humble faith and that that faith would look like obedience, Lord, because we love you, because we want to honor you. So I pray that this church family would, uh, would walk in obedience this week as we seek to honor you. For all these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thank you for being here. You are dismissed.